Good morning. It's uh, an honor to be here, uh, surrounded by so many people working on devices and specifications and technology that's going to continue to be massively important to the ongoing development of how we use computers, how we use devices. As Grant said, uh, these days I'm working as a security developer, but my background is very firmly rooted in working with various specifications, some of which you, uh, well, many of which you will have heard of, uh, many of which you will have very, a very wide range of personal opinions on. But I'm going to be talking about the role of standardization in the field of security and how we can improve the products that we're developing by engaging in the standardization process. Is there anyone here who doesn't own a computer? <laughs> right. Now, this is not entirely surprising. However, these days it is very difficult to find any set of people, regardless of whether you're at a technology conference or not, where there would be anybody who could genuinely say that they do not have a computer in their possession of some sort. And we've moved on from the days where a computer was something that you put on a desk in a room and left there. These days, laptops have been selling more than desktop computers for years. Rather than a computer being something that we leave in our house, a computer is now often something that we carry around with us. A computer is something that contains our knowledge that contains our data, that contains sensitive material, and which we still carry around with us on our person at all time. It's like, in many cases, carrying around a combination of your personal secret diary, which is also your contact list, which is also your uh, calendar. And this means that, for the majority of the time, you're carrying around an object that has an incredible amount of your personal data. But it actually goes further than this, because the rise in the use of smartphones means that even people who are not carrying around a laptop with them at all times, like many of us probably end up doing, are still carrying a device that contains, if anything, even more personal data. People use their phones for all sorts of purposes as in the past would have required an independent computer. And as a result, our phones contain even more data about us than our laptops typically do. Our phones track our location. Our phones keep information about who we're talking to. Phones are an incredibly rich source of information about us. And people will voluntarily carry these phones even knowing how much data they're putting within them. If a phone is stolen from you, this is not merely an inconvenience. There is a potential for someone who you don't trust to now know almost everything there is to know about you as an individual. And so when we think about computer security, obviously we think about our desktops, we think about our laptops. We even these days think about our phones. But what we're coming to realize as an industry is that limiting ourselves to thinking of the things, to just thinking about the things we typically think of as computers is insufficient. Anyone who's bought a mid-range car or above in the past few years is almost certainly driving something that runs significant quantities of complicated software. Now, this may be tied purely into, you know, we can think of software and cars in many ways, and obviously there's the visible software, the IVI stacks. And we've determined recently that these things can be quite terrifying, both in terms of the amount of personal data that they will gladly hand over if, for instance, in the case of Nissan, you simply explore a seven-digit range of vehicle IDs in order to locate any of these cars in the world and get their usage information. In cases where the Jeep Chrysler vehicles were 
not only addressable over the internet, the firewalling between the IVI system and the car's own functioning systems was sufficiently weak that someone could remotely access fundamental functionality like is the engine turned on or not and change that state. But even outside the cases of just security, we have to think about the flaws in the software because we have reason to believe that flaws in software running on certain Toyotas may have been linked to actual deaths. When we're designing these systems, the fact that these cars are computers is a fundamental part of this. We can no longer think of a device running firmware inside a car as being sufficiently simple that we can work on it without having to pay attention to the lessons we've learned elsewhere in the computing industry. We need to apply the same lessons there as well. And fine, this, I'm going to say, cars don't actually worry me because I'm one of those horrendously smug people who doesn't own a car. And so, for the most part, all I have to do is make sure that I'm not standing in front of a speeding, compromised car that someone's trying to murder me with. Light bulbs, on the other hand, I do have to worry about. The home is becoming an increasingly connected place, partly because, well, we've run out of other ways to sell things to people, but partly because, in many ways, these things do make our lives somewhat better. The fact that I can control my light bulbs by voice is a surprisingly transformative experience. I'm now able to turn my lights on while I'm still struggling to take off my jacket. I'm able to have my lights automatically turn on at a specific time at a low intensity and gradually ramp up in order to wake me up more gently. These things are surprisingly convenient to people. These are things that improve our lives. The fact that I can have a coffee machine that will automatically turn on and make me coffee as long as my lights were turned out within a certain time range, indicating that I'm going to need coffee. That's great. On the other hand, I now have a device that knows when I'm making coffee. I have a device that knows when I turn my lights on or not. In the connected home, we're generating more data than ever before. If you had full access to the data that I generate at home, you would know unambiguously which nights I spent in my home and which nights I didn't. You would know what time I came home. You would know what time I went to bed. And correlating these with other things you know about my life would allow you to get a very accurate picture of what kind of person I am, what kind of things I do. You would potentially be able to generate information that would be uh, embarrassing to reveal about me. The data we generate, as I said, tells anybody a great deal about who we are. And we often don't think about that. When we use a connected device, we are not thinking about what that information would tell a third party. We're trusting these devices because the alternative is, in many cases, to just not have the convenience. And so far, that trust has not been overly obviously betrayed. When we're designing these products, when we're designing systems that contain intelligence, when we're designing systems that collect user data, as almost all embedded devices end up doing, we have to ensure that the trust that users place in those devices is well placed. We have to ensure that the users will not feel betrayed by these devices. A worst case outcome for our industry is a population that no longer trusts devices that collect information about us. If people are unwilling to buy cars with complicated IVI systems, if people are unwilling to buy connected light bulbs, if people are unwilling to pay more money for a coffee machine that can be controlled from your phone, many of us are going to be out of jobs. 
which is potentially a depressing thing to think about on multiple axes. So it's our job to make sure that people can genuinely trust that the devices we produce, the devices that we sell to users, are secure, that they will not leak personal data. So far, we're not doing a particularly good job of this. In fact, we're doing a pretty abysmal job of this. I bought some light bulbs recently. Uh, partly this is because I'm quite cheap and the market leading bulbs are quite expensive, but I bought a fairly cheap set of allegedly Zigbee based bulbs and a controller. And obviously, because I know where this story is likely to end. The first thing I did after I plugged in the control device was to port scan it. And I discovered, firstly, that it was running Linux. And secondly, that it was running Telnet-D. <laughs> and when I connected to it, it said, raw link login. And if you ask Google for raw link default passwords, you discover that admin slash admin is usually the case. And so obviously that's not going to be true here. Nobody's going to ship a device that controls light bulbs. Oh, yeah. So fine, I've got a device that if you already have access to my network, you could infect and then persistently monitor stuff on my network. And I'd have no way of knowing because the device has no means of validating the state of the firmware. Okay, well, fine. You need access to my internal network in order to be able to do that. So that's okay. I use WPA2, I use a good passphrase. You're unlikely to gain access to my internal network. As long as, for instance, this device didn't also have, say, a built-in Wi-Fi chipset that was not part of the advertised specification, which was not broadcasting, but which had no security and was allow anyone to join, and was also running a Telnet D. As long as it doesn't do that, I'm fine. Sadly. A device that was intended to make my life easier made my life easier on multiple axes once more. Not only could I use it to control my light bulbs, I could also use it to gain access to my network if I ever forgot my passwords. <laughs> or anyone else. And this was unsurprisingly not well advertised in the specification list for this device. The marketing material did not mention these virtues. People who have followed my blog for some time may know that this kind of situation is not particularly unusual, that I seem to have a knack for discovering devices with terrifying security records that allow you to do all kinds of things that you shouldn't be able to do. The concerning thing is that while many of you may think that this is born out of some sort of masochistic tendency on my part, it's really not. I just happen to look for these flaws in devices I buy. And of devices I have bought in recent history that are running software, I, basically everything I've bought recently that isn't made of wood, the majority of them have had concerning security failings. If you go home and you find any devices you own that's a running software that's been manufactured in the past 10 years. The reality is that if you spent a little time looking at them closely, you would probably find equivalently terrifying security issues. Now, it's wonderful that we're able to sleep at night because we don't do this. But eventually, this is going to end up being used by people who are not well, I was going to say ethical enough to ensure that these things get fixed, but in fact, I'm just going to go with who are sufficiently jaded and cynical that they'll at least write blog posts about them 
rather than attack other people. But it doesn't have to be this way. Last year, I was utterly terrified to discover that Mattel were releasing a new Barbie doll that was internet connected, that would hold conversations with your child. Now, I'm sure none of us can think of anything that could possibly go wrong if a malicious actor were able to cause Barbie an obviously trustworthy source to say arbitrary things to your child. Barbie loves playing games with your child. There are several games that your child can play with this Barbie. And were Barbie to suggest to your child that an excellent game to play would be to find your parents' credit cards and read your numbers to Barbie. <laughs> That's probably one of the least bad outcomes we can come up with. So my assumption was that, well, obviously, this was going to be dreadful. And what I instead discovered was that the software stack on Barbie followed basically every single best practice I could come up with. The software is signed. Modifying the firmware on Barbie is not possible in any straightforward way. Barbie has pinned TLS certificates. If you attempt to man in the middle Barbie's communications with Barbie's servers, Barbie will tell you that something has gone wrong and not pass on any personal data. Barbie even ensures that the initial configuration data is being provided over SSL, such that someone sniffing is not able to obtain your wireless network credentials during the initial configuration. What I was most depressed about in this was that this was so surprising. <laughs> and then I thought further, and what I was even more depressed about was that Barbie is better than almost any other device I have purchased. <laughs> Secure device development is hard, except if you're Barbie. <laughs> what is wrong with our industry? How far have we fallen that most of us can't even meet a bar set by Barbie? And the challenges we're facing are not novel. If we want to say, oh, OK, this device should only run firmware that is trusted by the owner, that has been signed by the manufacturer. If we want to be able to say, if this device is going to connect to cloud storage, if it's going to be able to potentially access or submit new data that is going to be recorded about me, then it should have to prove that it is running the correct software stack, that it has not been subverted. These are not magical problems that nobody has previously considered. These are problems that we have tested, deployed solutions for. So at this conference, we're here because we understand the value of collaboration. We understand how important it is to share our knowledge. We understand the benefits of open source development in terms of allowing us to learn from mistakes other people have made and do better in future, to share our experiences with others and benefit the industry and the ecosystem as a whole. The aim of this conference is for us to come up with collaborative solutions that are better than what we had before. So why? When I buy many of these devices, many of which are embedded systems running Linux, do I keep discovering that people have reinvented this? Why do I find that someone has decided that the appropriate way to sign security updates is to use GPG to encrypt them and then leave the private key in the device firmware so that it can decrypt the updates, but not actually validate the signatures. 
Why does this kind of thing not surprise me? We are terrible at this. We keep coming up with novel solutions for security that don't actually make anything better. Everybody knows that the first thing you should do in crypto is don't invent your own crypto. How many of you have invented your own crypto? None of you put your hands up. That is good. How many of you are lying? <laughs> OK, slightly more hands. We make these mistakes because, in many cases, we don't know better. And that's justifiable in some ways. It is obviously a difficult problem space. And we are all intelligent people. The urge is always there to try to solve these problems ourselves. But when we attempt to do that, often we instead end up making things worse than they were before. We are giving the impression of security without any genuine security. And that is worse, because if we tell a user this device has no security, then a user is in a position to make some poor judgments about that device in an informed manner. But if we tell a user a device is secure, then a user is not informed. A user cannot make a rational judgment about whether they can trust this device with their personal data or not. The impression of security is more dangerous than no security. Trying to come up with new technologies, new techniques, new ideas, without any oversight, without any collaboration, without any opportunity for someone else to say, that's a terrible idea, don't do that, is a terrible idea, don't do that. Instead, we should identify ways that we can work together on this, ways that we can come up with security techniques and technologies that are well tested, that are well reviewed. We should think carefully about what kinds of processes are involved in developing this. We want to define best practices. We want to say there are certain types of cryptography that are the bare minimum. We want to be able to say it should not be possible to arbitrarily interfere with the operation of a device if you are not the trusted owner of that device. Ideally, once we've come up with a concept of what this should look like, we should not only talk to other people and ensure that these concepts are strong, that these concepts are meaningful, we should also write a good reference implementation of this. What we've found in the crypto world is frequently that even with a well-written, well-reviewed specification for how cryptography should be performed, implementations may themselves still be flawed. Early versions of the Nintendo Wii used RSA signatures with a strong cryptographic hash to verify games before they could be booted. And at a crypto level, this was all absolutely fine. There should have been no straightforward way to break this except for the fact that when the firmware compared the calculated hash to the signed hash, it used strukump and stopped at the first zero. <laughs> All it took was looking through the library of release games to find one with a signature that had a zero early on and then brute force a hash collision because when you only have two bytes of entropy, that doesn't take that long. A good implementation that others can review is vital here. If Nintendo had used someone else's code and had not interfered with it, they wouldn't have had that problem. But also, we want to be able to build an entire stack of security. Much of the security that we focus on is at the lower levels. It's the initial bootstrapping. It's the ability for a device to attest to its state. In order to build something that is useful for a user, we frequently need security that goes beyond that. But if a single part of your boot process is insecure, that typically means that all higher layers are no longer trustworthy. They can be compromised without interfering with the actually secure part of this. So 
when designing these security features, you need to think about what that looks as you go up the stack. You need to be able to provide guarantees about what you have done to higher levels. I don't want a situation where if I'm designing a software stack and at the last minute it's suddenly announced that we're going to change the platform that I'm running on to a different SOC vendor, I don't want to then have to reappraise certain security assumptions I've made. I should be able to have the same assumptions about what this platform is doing at the lower levels as I did for my previous platform. This being able to share this knowledge, being able to share these expectations means that we can concentrate on building best practices at other layers of the stack. Doing this in the context of industry-wide organizations is incredibly helpful because it makes it much less likely that we will limit our solutions to a smaller number of use cases, that we will inadvertently bake in certain assumptions about the kind of devices, the kinds of attacks into our specification, and then leave people who want to solve slightly different problems either having to compromise their designs or alternatively develop their own security again. We don't want that. We want all of these things to, to the maximum extent possible, cater to as many use cases and users as possible. And that means trying to do this at the industry level rather than just within specialized working groups. Doing this in a closed environment, doing this without any opportunity for subject matter experts outside our field to look at this and say, that's a really terrible idea, again, limits us. If we don't have the opportunity for other people to look at our solutions and come up with a meaningful justification for why they're correct or why they're incorrect, again, we are putting users at risk. And we've seen several success stories here. UEFI Secure Boot has been a spectacular success story on the x86 PC market. People who were previously attacking the early boot process instead had to start attacking different levels of the firmware. And miraculously, well, perhaps not so miraculously, so far, not a single vulnerability in the secure boot implementations themselves have been found. Attackers have instead had to find flaws in other levels of the firmware. And okay, this is an iterative process. Even when we come up with a solid security story in one component of the stack, there may still be flaws in other parts, and we still need to address those. But looking at a security solution and saying, well, that didn't fix 100% of the problems is kind of missing the point. This solved a large number of problems. And it's done so in a way that has altered the way that attackers have had to attempt to compromise user systems. The Trusted Computing Group has worked on TPM-related specifications for over a decade now. And these are core to many security products that are already widely deployed. Current versions of Windows, when installed on hardware of the TPM, will encrypt your file system and do so in a way that makes it almost impossible for anybody without physical access to your system to extract that data later. If the boot process is tampered with, the TPM will not release the decryption key required to gain access to the system or the data. Again, nobody has found significant flaws in this. This specification has been open for a long time. Users trust this. Users depend on the security of implementations of these specifications. And so far, they appear to place that trust in a legitimate manner. They have not been misled as to the security. When we're designing systems, when we are coming up with solutions, there are many ways that we can compete. We can make better products than each other. The entire point of this industry is to try to do better than our competition. Security is not a place where you should attempt to differentiate. Do not do exciting things with security <laughs> because People who've been doing this for decades, people who have been going through 
meaningful review cycles, people who know exactly what they're doing will still screw up. And the more eyes we get on a security implementation, the less likely it is that we will make these mistakes, that we will allow these flaws to pass through and into user systems. But when we're thinking about security, we need to go a little further than this. And I'm going to go for an emotional attachment here. How many of you have children that you have given your old phone to? A lot of you, right. How many of those phones are still supported by the manufacturer? How many of them still get security updates? Why have you given your child a device that you know is running insecure software? This industry is still developing rapidly. We are still pushing all kinds of boundaries. Every year, it's our job to come up with something that is better than what was available the year before. We very rapidly iterate through product development. By the time a product hits market, many of us will not merely be working on the device that comes after that. We'll be working on the device that comes after that. It's, in most cases, not our job to think about the security of a device that's already been shipped. The time that a specific device will be on the market is fairly short in many cases. But the lifetime of a device is wildly out of sync with the support cycles that we typically assign to that device. While we may work on six to nine month product cycles, phones will be used for massively longer than that. And even in the best cases, we're seeing phones be supported for maybe two or three years. But many people will carry on using devices longer than that. Even when we have come up with the best security story we have at the time, even when we have done everything we could to make sure that as shipped this device was secure, and even if we've spent the next two years providing security updates for that, if there's no way for anyone else to change that security policy to improve the security of that device after we've shipped it, the probability is that it will still end up being broken. And people who are, in many cases, the least able to do something about this are going to be the ones who will suffer as a result. So all of us here, all of us who are working to develop devices that will be the future of our industry, devices that will make it easier and more exciting for people to achieve tasks, devices that will make life better for people, we still have to think about what kind of legacy we're going to be leaving behind. Are we developing devices and ecosystems that will allow people to obtain increasing quantities of information about themselves and control that and find out things? People able to monitor their sleep in a meaningful way, people able to get insight into their health based on technology we've developed and data that we collect. We can think of this and everything that we're working on as being the key to allowing people to make better decisions about many aspects of their lives. We can think of this as making it easier for people to have convenient, straightforward lives. Or we can think of this as an era where we instead developed technology that made it easier than ever before to blackmail people to interfere with their lives, to compromise their lives, to really make people unhappy. So when we're making design decisions, when we're not only implementing our security, but also thinking about what the long-term support story of a device is, let's think about whether we are going to be remembered as people who enabled good things in life or people who made it easier than ever before to destroy people's lives and let's make some good choices about our designs as a result of that. Thank you.